Yuletide felicitations to all Inkscapers, Inkscapees, and Inkscapists. My name is Tim, and I will be your resident professor of Inkscapeology on this episode of Inkscope, the Inkscape podcast. This episode in the Spotlight series takes a slightly medical turn. Our guest has a doctorate in Vectoronomy, is a general practitioner of Pythonatomy, and in their spare time can be seen jiggling their Django on the dance floor. For all this and much more, join me after the intro. Don't go away. Welcome back. Joining me today is Dr. Mo, Martin Owens. Thanks for coming to the show, Martin. Hey, Tim. Uh, Merry Christmas. Uh, Merry I Christmas. I want to offer you a, a Christmas pie. Oh, I I'd love one. Hope you've got a drink. <laughs> I do indeed. Cheers and Merry Christmas. Uh, yeah, it's been a bit of a rough year, but uh, you know, cr- Christmas is still on. Oh, yes, definitely. Definitely. So, Martin, as, as normal, my first question always is, who is Martin Owens, the person? So I am a, a British uh, expat. So I live in Boston, the USA, but I'm originally from uh, Widnes, uh, England. That's a little town that's just outside of Liverpool. Uh, so I consider myself to be a northerner. Um, I consider myself to be left wing, and I am both um, a programmer. And I consider myself to be uh, on the creative arm. So, like, I've, I've never been formally educated. I basically left um, secondary school at 16 and then immediately got a job as a programmer. Um, so I've never actually had university education. And uh, I've always considered my programming to be um, the less for, for, from formal mathematics and more uh, creative and um, both like like industrious engineering, right? Like man in a shed type stuff. Um, so did you teach is, yourself the programming or did you have some of that from school or are you completely so no, self-taught? Yeah. So it's, it's, it's interesting. Nothing, uh, none of my programming came from my high school. Um, it was an ex grammar school, which in English terms is a, is a pretty sort of Etonian styled uh, secondary school. But uh, I did sneak out of school in the evenings and, and attend classes at the local college. So from the age of about 12, I was basically going a, 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 a behind my school's back in order to go to right. uh, college courses. And I did Visual Basic. I did some um, uh, 3D gra- graphics, which involved some programming. I did uh, HTML, a bunch of other different things, all like short co- courses and things. But... Um, and nobody told me that I couldn't, so I just kept on signing up and go going. Um, and it's it, it's interesting because it's like it, it, it's nothing that I could write on a piece of paper, and paper uh, to give to an, a potential employer and say, "Oh, I have this qualification." But it is an experience to get somebody into um, the, the the computer arts because you do need access to a computer in order to be able to learn things. Um, and one of the things, because because of the, uh, the poverty that I come from, I never had a computer at home. So the the, the local co- college was actually critical from, for me to be able to access the technology I needed to get sort of like on the first step of the ladder to, to get myself into uh, programming. And as soon as I was able to leave school and get a job, I was able to then get enough money together to, to buy a computer of, of my own. So you knew um, from an early age then that you wanted to do programming so so what was your what was the influence on you that that sort of drove you in that direction um no it's 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 interesting because uh programming is one of those things that i have always known that i am good at and i should do because i'm good at it um and at the same time um it motivates me because i like the creative element of being able to make things um so like building things with Lego. I used to build things with Meccano, if you remember that. Um, lots of 1990s toys that would always be very interesting. My mom has stories and stories of me taking things apart. Um, so if you if you have a child who you, you know, you come downstairs and you find like the VCR or the Nintendo Switch is like in bits, 
take a deep breath. <laughs> <laughs> They're a programmer. <laughs> and yeah, and, and, and uh, you know, quietly explain to them why what they did was wrong, and then also uh, point them in the direction of getting them, you know, electrical kits or, or getting them, um, you know, access to a library where they might have access to, to um, machines where they can learn. Um, because there are lots of fun things to be able to do with technology, and uh, you know, previous generations don't necessarily understand or know what kids will find interesting. Yeah. So the best thing you can do is just provide the the um, the technology for the kids to maybe break, but like be confident that they they can you know access it. Yeah. So pie. you mentioned that you originally came from the UK, but you're not currently living in the UK. So where in the world mm -hmm. are you at the moment, if you don't mind answering that? No. So um, when I was young, I um got to know somebody online and I uh, courted them for a, num a number of years and eventually I moved uh, to to them uh, in, in here here in America. Um, I've been with my wife Karma now for 14 years and um, no 5,100 days as we actually do it by, <laughs> by 100 day increments so we can celebrate more often. Um, uh, and I feel incredibly lucky to have been um, sort of like given the opportunity to uh, move to a different country, um, learn different cultures, uh, marry an amazing woman. Um, and what's interesting actually is that when I was in the UK, I worked in L L London for, for, for a period of time. And I noticed that when I moved to America, the wages for a programmer uh, literally doubled. I mean, it's it's an, it's an incredible thing. Like the same skills, uh, the respect, and the pay, massively increased. And um, I don't know why the UK has such a sort of like blue collar attitude towards pro programmers. Um, but in America, at least you're given the opportunity. Like it, America has a lot of problems, but for at least for technology, they recognise the the skills. So obviously, um, you're married. Any children? I do. I have one da daughter. She's she's nine now. Um, she helped us decorate the tree. Excellent. It's a beautiful uh, her, tree. Her name's and I know, right? Um, her, her name's Violet. Oh, that's a lovely um, name. It, yeah, she's currently upstairs playing Minecraft. I think. <laughs> As they do. <laughs> they, they they do that, don't don't they? Though. Right, Martin. There's a really important question that I need to ask you. The bowler hat. Mm -hmm. Why? Where? Where? How? What is the story behind the bowler hat? So, um, this the 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 hat is actually from my wife. She bought it for me when I was living in London, and we were courting online. Uh, at first, I was a little bit uncertain because, uh, being from the north, I know my place. Right, it's flat cap territory, not not the bowler hats. Um, but then I, I when when I thought about it, I'm like, damn sumptuary laws, right? I should be able to wear whatever nice things I want. Plus, my wife's ar ar argument still still holds, and that this style of hat fits my head very, very well. And if you've ever seen me wearing a baseball cap, uh, it looks terrible <laughs> because my head is just bowler hat shaped. So I've accepted my fate. <laughs> <laughs> that's crazy so when did you first discover inkscape let's get in let's get into inkscape when did you first discover ink um so you know inkscape is a is the tool that i came to because i was uh still involved in doing cre creative work but i was moving more and more heavily into being a free software advocate uh using linux exclusively uh, ever since windows 98 in fact i've, I've been a linux user um and so without access to Coral Draw, which is what I, I used to use, I moved to using Inkscape um, way, way back in the time. But that doesn't mean that I immediately started to contribute to the project. Um, at first, I moved into contributing to, um, to Perl uh, and also to the Ubuntu project. So I spent a long time in the Ubuntu community. I ran a local community cha chapter. Um, 
I organized uh, making stickers and doing graphics work. And you can see like the, the graphics is involved even throughout, throughout this whole process. Um, and then when the Ubuntu pro project started to, the wheels just started to fall off the, the community of the Ubuntu project, um, I, I moved to doing Inkscape work. Um, something that I felt was more uh, free software focused and also more uh, stable in terms of like- So what sort of year would that have been? I can imagine, let's see, it's probably about 2012, okay. but it's all, it's all chuck and change because I contributed, for instance, the barcode plugin um, well before that um, and then refactored it later. And, and so like there's contributions that came in earlier, but I wasn't really involved in the same sort of consistent way. Uh, and that's the great thing about projects like Inkscape is that you can, you can contribute a little bit and then you can go away and do other things for five years and then you can come back and then maybe you do a little thing or maybe you like commit yourself to a year's worth of like volunteering or you know whatever whatever fits your particular uh period in your life or the motivation that you currently have right then or in fact if you've been hired to do something like work on Inkscape. So how did you go from uh just helping out and doing extensions and stuff like to actually becoming part of the Inkscape team. What, what was that process? Um, and how did you transition into that? Yeah, I think, I think because I was involved with the Ubuntu project, um, I had a bit more confidence in being able to put myself forwards. Um, I felt confident in, in, uh, organizing physical events, uh, attending other physical events and, um, basically put, putting myself forwards as talking to different parts of the project and trying to recognize where Inkscape itself had um, communications issues or technical issues. And so a good example of one of the first contributions, well, f the first times I kind of like put myself forwards is we had a lull in development of Inkscape um, where most of the uh, developers had been employed by Canonical to work on Ubuntu uh, or they'd moved on to other projects and there was precious little going on. It was just like there was some development going on, there was Google Summer of Codes going on, but like there was no releases happening and there was no community management happening. And so the the project itself was moribund in a way. And I kind of put myself out there and said, we need to make a release. Like whatever, whatever, whatever we have, like we can't have a bunch of developers using a completely different piece of software than the, the stable version that we're telling everybody else to, to use, right? That's, that's not fair, right? If, you know, developers have five years of cha changes that have happened um, and they get to enjoy features and all of the various things. It doesn't matter whether it's stable or not. The, the, the problem is, is like, you're not really keeping up with things. And so you get disconnected. I mean, we're, we're, the Inkscape project has traditionally always been pretty dis disconnected from its users, but this was a case of it being technologically disconnected. It might as well have been a distinct code base. Um, the people were using a different product. Um, and so like, I felt the project needed a bit of um, direction and, and, a, and a more uh, more focus on community. So I started working on um, uh, recruitment, on uh, emphasizing uh, design, emphasizing uh, uh, the contributions of things like ve vectors, I was very keen to make sure that anybody who came into the Inkscape project and said they wanted to, you know, write news articles or, or promote things on Facebook or like whatever it was that they or make a podcast or make a podcast, <laughs> whatever it is that they were motivated to do, that they had somebody who they could talk to, who would give them permission to do things. Um, and, you know, there are definitely other people in the pro project that have the same view, right? That, that the, the goal of um, community management is to uh, enable contributors to come into a project and uh, to kind of just have permission to 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 play, yeah. to produce, to collaborate, uh, and then also provide them with some fr frameworks. Like if they have a, a dispute with somebody else, that they have somebody to go to that they can re resolve the dispute. Um, or if they need access to materials, or if they need a budget, for for instance, like they want to be able to print stickers out. Um, that's the kind of thing where. You know, it's great that you can go to the board and get a vote and get some money for some stickers, but who in their right mind could go like just wanders into a project uh, cold 
and knows how to do that and who to talk to and so, so, so on. So you, you, you have to spend the time um, talking to p p people and generating a, um, a relationship so that you can be confident that if nothing else, at least they'll be able to email you or strike up a chat with you and, and, and ask you questions about like, where would I go for this problem and so yeah. forth. I mean, that was one of the things I found when uh, I joined in with Vector. You don't feel as though you have the ability to take control. You have wonderful ideas. You, you come fired up. You've got ideas and you think, I can't just run with that because who am I? You know, I'm right. this, I'm this nobody, and you know, there's all these, you know, um, amazing developers, and uh, I don't have the authority to come in and say I want to do this, and and I think yep. what you're saying is really important. There needs to be, and there is people there now that say, you know, hey, great idea, you lead it, we'll follow, we'll help you out with it, let's make it happen, and. Um, Think... Yeah, and in, in another way, uh, what part, part of the process of doing that is creating the uh, the symbols and the spaces, right? So, so the spaces are things like the chat rooms and the forums and the various other places where you can say, online, this is the place where people who are interested in co contributing this particular kind of thing go here to talk about it. And the sy symbols are basically things that you can say, okay, this is a a team with this logo and this you know motto or this charter or like whatever it is. Those things are important because they provide a rallying point yeah. and people can say, oh, I'm in the Vectors team, right? If the Vectors team didn't have a name and it didn't have a uh, effectively a, a job to do that was well-defined, people who wanted to contribute in the Vectors area wouldn't have a stru structure to climb on. Um, so it's important that a project be able to like um, think about the community as not just people, but also um some components right rods and sticks that pe people can occupy so we've we've mentioned vectors a couple of times now but can you quickly just explain to people that don't know what is the vectors team what part do they play within the inkscape team yeah i love i love a good pun and that and that, that name is great so the idea between the vectors team is that it's a outreach and um uh, basically, it's a it's a team that uh, its job is to popularize Inkscape. It's to push it out there. It's to uh, figure out ways of engaging with users. Um, it's to it's the social media, but it's also like if you wanted to talk to the press, for instance, the Vectors team is the appropriate place to go. Um, if you wanted to organize uh, an interview with somebody, if you wanted to do a podcast like this, the Vectors team is the is the place to go. Um, and it allows us to focus everything and have meetings that you know can talk about all of these particular kind of outreach efforts. So if somebody is listening to this now, watching this now, and they want to get involved, where should they go and what should they do to get involved with Vectors or any other part of the escape? Yeah, so I mean, the, the first thing to consider is uh, what would you like to contribute? Uh, because there is you know, lots of lots of ways that you can contribute time. And um, the first thing to do is to come into the Rocket Chats or the forums or the mailing list, introduce yourself, uh, say what you would like to be able to achieve. Um, and if you're not sure, ask, say, I'd, I'd like to contribute some time. These are my skills, but I don't know uh, what you need right now. And, you know, somebody uh, maybe me, maybe somebody else will come and say, "Oh, uh, you know, it's nice to meet you. The, this is a place where we could need we need some help." Um, and one one good thing is that uh, I forget which politician it was. I think it was one of the American pres presidents that basically ran his entire cabinet on the idea of asking for favors. And the, the, the whole idea was that you 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 would build a relationship by asking people to do small jobs for you, inconsequential, not huge responsibilities or things, but things that would uh give you a sort of like back and forth of like oh you helped me with this small issue so i'll you know help you with that that kind of thing can really help and so being generous with uh specific requests from somebody else it can be really helpful um so i encourage p people to ask uh you know if they feel like some particular thing a bug needs to be fixed or a website feature needs to be done or whatever it is um 
going to a, an individual and asking that individual for help can be a really good way to strike a relationship. Yeah. Um, it's fairly ineffective in terms of free and open source pro projects to go into a team as a whole or a project as a whole and just announce that a problem exists and or even that you need help in the gen generic sense um, simply because it, it, it lacks f focus. And if somebody comes in and does help you, it, it doesn't really create the same kind of dynamic and, and relationship. Yeah. Um, so if somebody wanted to, uh, it, they come with an idea. Uh, a lot of people think just present the idea and someone's going to jump in and take that idea and run with it. Um, so how do you, how do you then coax that person round to say, Hey, you come with the idea. Why don't you lead that idea? How do you approach that? Because people sometimes want to throw ideas out there, but they don't necessarily want to take the lead. So how would you deal with that scenario? Yeah, I mean, it's uh, so w what I do right now as a programmer, I'm, I don't have a, a, an employer. I'm a contractor, which means I take um, small gigs from different companies um, and I program for them. But what I've learned from doing that kind of work is that, um, you know, when a, when a client or a random person online comes to you with an idea, um, if they uh, just give you like the raw idea, it's a lot of work to, to fashion that into, like even turning that into, a, into an actionable thing is an awful lot of work. It's design, it's thinking, it's integration, it's relationships, it's like it's a whole bunch of stuff. For a client, it's easier because you can just turn, turn around to them and say, look, this is great and I'll do it, but it's going to be expensive and this is how much money it's going to co cost you because you've come to me with basically a half-baked idea. Uh, why don't we sit down together and we can spend much less money like doing the, the all of the work to fashion this into into something actionable because as a programmer like I, I really want to be spending my time coding not you know doing all of this le legwork work to be fair most of it is guesswork right I'm, yeah. I'm anticipating what the client wants um which is not fair to them they they, they really i'm um, like some clients need hand hold, 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 holding that's completely fine um, but, but the same thing goes to a person who is online. Uh, if they come to you with an idea, there's a, there's a lot of work that needs to be put in. And so, and so um, you know, you can't just come up to somebody and say, oh, that's a great idea, but now it needs an awful lot of um, effort and you're now responsible for doing it because that doesn't always work. Uh, the first thing I try and think about is what is the scale of the thing that they're asking for? Right. So if they're asking for something really, really huge, the best thing that I can say to them is uh, come into this issue thread or into this particular thing, subscribe to it so you can monitor like, what's going on with the problem. Contribute to the ideas that are currently go going. So like read through the whole thing and see if, if there is anything you can add, because sometimes there's not like it's already been said that this is a problem or this is a feed feature or whatever it is. Um, and then you have to consider whether what the problem, what a really, really big problem needs is uh, funding, right? Or it needs some kind of material um, process that, that can hire a developer or like convince somebody to spend a, a lot of time programming a thing. But that's a whole, that, that like, you've got to be involved in the community by that point. You've got to be uh, building building relationships um, and sometimes means that you can help out doing other things while you're building those relationships but it's it's never an, it's never gonna it's never gonna be the case that your suggestion of an idea um, resulted in the idea being done um, for smaller things it's slightly easier to do a barter a straight barter um, good example of that is Chris Rogers who you had on last week uh, he came to me and he said, look, I really, really want this feature. And I thought about it. It wasn't a small problem. It was, you know, d a difficult thing. And I thought about it and I thought, okay, so one of the things that I needed was some graphics. And he's a graphics per person. So I said, okay, how, how about we work out a, si a situation where you do me some gra graphics and I'll, and I'll do this feature for you. And, and that, was a good, that was a good opportunity. It was a private uh, relationship. Like it wasn't done publicly. It was... Uh, 
me and him basically creating a relationship um, to do work for each other. And that can work out very, very well too, because at least in that circumstance, everybody, everybody understands that, uh, you know, work is work, pay is pay. Uh, we're being respectful of everybody's time and responsibilities. And that, you know, when, if you can't contribute yourself, then you've got to understand that like you're not going to have the same level of voice that you would have if you were able to actually contribute and you don't even have to contribute code but but like showing that you're involved can can really 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 change it yeah i think it's important to say to people that you don't have to dive in straight away just come along to mm -hmm. the chat rocket chat um browse around read comments yep. um go through issues look around I would encourage people to join the vectors meetings that we have monthly don't need to participate just lurk around just uh, think of them as the live chat. streams yeah yeah just follow along and do that for a couple of weeks a couple of months and until you feel ready and confident yes. enough to to join in and then just we always at the beginning always give an opportunity for people to say hello this is me um introduce yourselves and Give you an opportunity to say what you'd like to be involved in um come along don't feel pressurized to do anything you don't want to do just look around find out what the lay of the land yeah. is and and hopefully you'll join us and you'll join in and get a lot of pleasure from it you, um yeah i mean you, you you don't you don't have to be a free software uh zealot yeah. like i am right you, you you can be just a regular person with normal politics about computers <laughs> and uh you know but in, involve yourself in small ways and yeah. i mean um, i don't code i know absolutely nothing right. about code um but i come along i join in i help where i can if there's some uh bug fixes that need looking at testing i'll get involved yep there's always something for people to do of all abilities it's not always about code um, we need translation, doing, we need mm -hmm. news articles written. There's lots of things for people to get involved Absolutely. in. Absolutely. And, and conversely, one of the thing, one of the cultural elements that I've been trying to push um, is that contributors who contribute non-code non things should have just as much respect for their contributions as people who do code. Absolutely. Like, Inkscape is not a coding project, right? It is a, it is a software project which encompasses design and outreach and testing and like ux and like all of these teams and all of these people that are involved in all so many diff different ways do an amazing job because it saves like a programmer trying to do design it, he's going to spend like hundreds of hours to, like get, getting a rubbish result right whereas like if there was a if there's a specialist who can who has the respect that like his skills are worthy of being listened to which is just as important um then you can like he'll he'll do the work for you and then you can just do the programming part implement the design as it is uh and not question like every little thing because that'll just annoy the designer um and you can actually get get like you can get really nice results from so, from that relationship and i and i feel like that there's a lot of open source projects that don't have a positive relationship between programmers and um non-programmer contributors um, and I'm happy to say that I, I feel like Inkscape is definitely a pro project that um, pushes contributions uh, from anybody. Yeah. So that segues quite nicely into the next part. So I'd like to ask you about what you do within the Inkscape team. So I'm going to need some on... tea for this. <laughs> you work on the website, um, built the forum, uh, work on extensions and fixing bugs. Where do you find yeah. the time? Where do you find the time for all this? <laughs> tell me about it. Um, so I'm 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 lucky in, in a lot of ways because I can um, choose to take clients privately, um, and I earn a good living from from doing um, client work. When I I focused more on the Inkscape work, it has uh, drained the coffers, right? Because I'm I'm investing in Inkscape. Uh, a lot of time as you say um but like that's that like i honestly feel like inkscape needs more full-time people 
just to be able to keep, give it a, a, a cultural consistency and a relationship consistency. And, you know, that no matter what, what is happening, there's at least one or two individuals who are sort of alive and can talk about an issue or like, you can see that things keep on move, move, moving. Um, so you, main, you what maintain the um, website. Are, are you solely yeah, responsible for the website or are there other people that work with you on the website? So uh, the design of the website is always a, a designer. Um, so the original design for the the website itself is Herenge. Herenge. I, I'm so I apologize so much for not being able to pronounce your name. Uh, and the forums as well, which are still part of the website. Uh, this is a designer. Is it Michelle that did that? Um, and uh, you know, uh, Habir has contributed, and you know, there's been contributions, but. The vast majority of the website's code, the Python, the Django, the website administration, the security, the other stuff, that's been done by me because it had to be done. Um, when I saw the state that we were in with the website, I was on SourceForge and it was uh, old and we had, the, we had designers giving those designs for websites and students who were starting to make websites. Uh, but never finishing it because it didn't have time or it, like what well, wasn't organized they were just sort of like thrown thrown all oh, go, go and do it over here and then come back to us when it's all finished right um so i kind of stepped in as a senior partner and and, and saying okay we need to organize this and, and like get it deployed and actually push it forwards and i ended up basically being the sole developer for a long time um adding features a release manager adding uh, teams, adding resource uploads, adding like lots, like over many years now. Um, and, you know, it's, it's, it's good because it's actually helped some of my pri private clients. Um, it allows me to push uh, Django projects in the private world as being free software. So like I push MIT and Harvard to have AGPL v3 uh, Django projects simply because I can say, look, I can reuse a lot of this code that I have in the Inkscape website and um, you get to have a cheaper result. All you have to do is like not have this loss aversion and like, you know, open your code up. And a lot of them are very receptive to that because like the, it, it's in no researcher's business to uh, be a publishing house for software, right? So you, you also, did you build the forum? Or was I that did, yeah. yeah? So you worked on that. <laughs> you coded all that. <laughs> yeah. I, I, so uh, we had a very long discussion about um, whether we should uh, use a, a, a PHP based bulletin board or whether we should like off the shelf components. And the problem is, is that there's there was no um, system administrator or DevOps person available who could do it and. Um, we waited for time while we were having this discussion and we we're going through the motions and we looked out for people who could like, deploy a bulletin board or whatever. And like, it, it, the resources just didn't line up. So eventually it was one of the, another case of this, like sometimes you just have to bite the bullet and do the job. And uh, the forums, we, like I had wonderful contributions from Bryn and from, um, who's the other person? I keep on thinking of Michelle, but I get it's so we had a number of individuals who were experienced with all the Ringscape forums, right? They they'd been admins, they'd been sys sys admins, they like they they organized, but they weren't confident enough to be able to actually run a forum internally inside the project uh, and do all of the like back back end work. So we worked with them on building the forum from scratch, um, and I'm and, I, and I'm very actually I'm very happy with the with the outcome. I think it's a um, efficient and um a fairly solid forum it's not it's perfect. a very good platform um but it, it it's got it's got all the features that we need to keep spam out which was the like number one thing i honestly when i when i heard brim bring to give me the list of like spam features i was like this is excessive but since i've <laughs> since i've seen the level of spam uh, and the ways in which spam is attack a site uh yeah they were all very much required and and uh i'm very happy to um to big up Bryn's uh, uh consultancy basically she consulted yeah. on the forum to, like, get yeah. to, to put it into put it into shape absolutely 
Um, but yeah, the co like coding J Django is, a, is 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 fairly straightforward. But you just have to commit yourself to being able to do the features that you need. Uh, and then look after them once they're deployed. And that's the only that's the only problem is that I've I put myself in a corner where I know I have some responsibilities now to look after a website um, that I may not I might not have had if it was an off the shelf component. Yeah. So there's lots of opportunities for people if if people are out there that have experience this type of coding or DevOps mm -hmm. or or management type skills. Oh yeah. You can see there's a desperate need. So come forward. You know, like I say, you don't need to get involved straight away. Lurk around, get the lay of the land. But there are lots of opportunities for people to help out. There really, I are. mean, there are people. There are people who literally they they uh, contribute by looking at the uh, nginx configuration that's in that's committed to the Git repository, and they suggest changes to the ciphers so to to like improve the security of the site. That's all they did. They came. They like said, "Oh, you should do this instead." And we committed their their contributions, and it's great because like yeah. it's it's not something I'm expert in, and to have that little helping hand, it helps. Yeah, brilliant. So recently, you've created a Patreon. So can you explain why Patreon? What's the goal? What's that all about? Um. So I am. Um, So I'm not just a free software ad advocate. I'm also a left winger, and I believe in workers' rights as well as I believe in free software. So, to have a situation where we have uh, developers who have no pro prospects of being paid to work on Inkscape, and users who have no say in in what gets developed in Inkscape, is a is a broken bridge that needs to be filled, and. Uh, Unfortunately, when attacking the problem from inside the Inkscape project, we have encountered uh, the fact that the project is set up as a 5013C charity in the US under the Software Freedom Conservancy. And this puts in a lot of constrictions about like who we can hire for what, and it has to be done in the public interest and so forth. So for my vision of having uh, users in control, they have to be able to specify what work gets done and they also have to be able to pay us money and it's not donations it's not a gift it is a payment for services rent, rent rendered and this is somewhat incompatible with how the project as a whole is is constructed internally um but this is okay because you know, being a 5013c is not a complete detriment there are very good advantages for reasons why you do do, do that and the projects project structures and the project's uh, infrastructure suits the 5013C very well. Uh, but when it comes to being paid to do programming work or even design work or other work on Inkscape, you have to have a separate business. Now, I've been contracted to work on Inkscape before, right? A, a, a company, usually they're small and medium-sized, will come to me and say, oh, I, I hear you, you're a programmer, a contractor who can work on Inkscape. Can you fix this pro problem that we have. Uh, I believe the first one that I worked on was a CSS problem. Um, and, you know, you, 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 you can bill good money for that. You can deliver builds to them. Uh, and hopefully it goes into the project as a whole and, and you're contributing to the stream. Um, but just serving small and medium sized businesses is not sufficient, right? The vast majority of Inkscape users are not those they are individuals right they're people making crafts uh and selling them people making artworks people making animations people drafting schools colleges workshops like there's loads of very very tiny individuals like who don't have the money to hire me as a person right but uh when i heard about a project called subable many years ago by the uh by uh, Hank Green for, of YouTube fame. Uh, I was fascinated by the, the the business opportunities that it was trying to create for YouTube creators. They have much the same problem where they need to be able to monetize the act of creating things in the future, right? So they need to be able to ask their viewers, in this case, for money, not for the things that they've done that they've already 
published and, and, and put onto YouTube, but for videos that they will do, right? The promise of things in the future, which is absolutely fascinating. My mind was blown when like, I, I, I like fully understood the, the, the dynamic of getting users to understand that they have a stake in this game and that they, they can uh, contribute, get some rewards out of it, but also like make sure that this thing that they love continues on. Uh, and you don't actually need that very, you don't need a lot of the, you don't need a, even a percent of the, the total number of users to subscribe to you on, on places like Subable uh, before you have a, a, a reasonable income, right? And you can start employing people, multiple individuals. Um, Subable got bought out by Patreon uh, simply because Hank Green is a very busy man. He creates lots of businesses like, like a fountain. Uh, so, so I looked very like into pa Patreon's particular model. Now, um, there are objections in the free software world that Patreon is not a free software plat platform. That is completely re reasonable. It's not free software, um, but it's also not, you know, it's not Microsoft. It's not Facebook. It's not a huge conglomeration. They've done a lot of the, the legwork for multiple countries and lang languages and tax laws. And like, does that's, that's not insignificant amounts of work that you need to do to be able to accept money from people all, all around the world. Um, and they're, they're, they're in the right place at the right time. Uh, could they become evil in the future? Maybe. Um, but my current view of them is that I have um, like respect for the work that they've done. Uh, and I don't want to hold it against them, the fact that they that on the particular issue of being on, on using a, a piece of code that's not free software. I don't want to like stop, uh, you know, I'll stop on that. Uh, sometimes you do have to make compromises in your uh, radical views. And, and that's one of them that I think is important. Um, and, and, and precisely because I think that introducing more economic uh, opportunities into the free software world is more important than like every single little thing being free software at the present time. Uh, but what do you think actually of the of the Patreon? Um, I've not really looked into Patreon personally. I mean, obviously, I know a lot of people on YouTube Patreon for funding. Um, yep. It's not really something that I've thought of uh, for me personally. Um, but I've got no objection to to that model at all. Um, I just wondered if is this something that only you are doing at the moment or is this something that other developers within Inkscape are, are thinking of doing or currently do or so are, i'm actually the <laughs> or are I'm you a trailblazer the, i'm not <laughs> that's the thing I'm, I'm i'm literally the last per person uh, to to join up so right before i joined there was three other developers uh mark javier and tav who uh, they're all in europe they all have uh patreon accounts and right so all... we can we can link to those at the bottom of this have, yeah. video and we all four of us are now sitting there on Patreon, and uh, you know it, it's it's running a Patreon is hard work. Yeah. Um, uh, Tav and and, and Mark um, and and Javier they have full they have jobs they have things yeah. to do and families to run da da da, and um, as I'm finding out, I've been running the Patreon now for about six months. I'm doing a weekly video because I think that's more impactful. And I'm trying to listen to users and engage with them on places like t Twitter in order to put myself out there, which can look a bit uh, uh, garish, maybe, uncouth. But I think it's important because, as I said before, one of the things that Inkscape as a pro project has, has struggled with is engaging users. Um, and I feel like engaging them in a discussion about uh, money and paying and being involved, like, Contributing not through time but through money is a discussion we need to have with, with our users. Yeah, uh, simply because it 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 benefits our users for Inkscape to improve faster. Yeah. Um, now, this hasn't met with uh, happy faces all round. Like there's a lot of old guard uh, programmers who they have full time jobs. They're not at risk. Like they don't um, struggle for the, their income. And their, their model of how open source works is basically you get a full-time job at some large co co corporation and then you spend your spare time working on uh, your side project. And that definitely is a good contribution to make, but it does not encourage the kind of, um, it, it, um, it doesn't build this bridge between the user, 
demand yeah. and the developer supply. Uh, and it certainly doesn't help us when it comes to things like um, Inkscape's fairly poor uh, demographics, right? The, the most people who contribute to Inkscape are, are white men still. Um, we'd love to be able to change that. Um, so, you know, with the, the project has work to do in order to be able to build more bridges to users, whether it's, it's inc encouraging users to join the pro project and contribute their time, or whether it's meet the users where they are, listen to what they want and ask the users for money. Um, and like, but we, we should be trying all of these things uh, uh, to figure out what works, because I don't think there are a lot of uh, free software pro projects yet that have worked out exactly what the, the kind of model that we need to make free software itself sustainable. Yeah. Yeah, but I think I think it's important to mention that we um, we will include the donation link directly to Inkscape as well. Oh yeah. So you know people can uh, if if they want to donate to the project they can donate. If they want to donate mm -hmm. to individuals that perhaps do um, coding work that is specific to their needs, then they can donate that way. So I'll speak I'll speak to the fact that I I am on the Inkscape board, and um, so I have views about how the Inkscape project itself should spend its for public interest charity yeah. donations. Um, I, I feel like, as well as the infrastructure, which is very important to being making sure that Inkscape is continued to be delivered, um, we have a great opportunity to create uh, uh, grants and fund funding for uh, minorities and women and various other people to come in and, and contribute to the project, having like defined jobs that need to doing yeah. uh, for the public interest. As long as that's clear, right? Like the job isn't uh, to make a feature because like a whole bunch of users want it. That's not what the public interest is for. The public interest is really about like figuring out what um, actually helps the project structures grow, uh, helps contributors come in, helps, uh, helps with demographic pro pro problems and, and like making sure that our culture can accommodate. Um, and I think we, we, we do have some great opportunities in the future to be able to uh, use all of the very generous donations that we have from uh, corporations as well as individuals who, who donate to the Inkscape uh, 5013C um, and, just, and just like use that to uh, make Inkscape the most accessible it can be. So we've talked a lot about Inkscape and your involvement with Inkscape and things like that. But I know another passion of yours is open source. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so do you want to talk a, a bit about why you're so passionate about open source? Perhaps explain to um, people who don't know what open source and Linux and things like that are. Perhaps, um, you know, use this opportunity to Put your point of view of why you think open source is so important. I know it's 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 funny that you you say open source because I know that's the most recognizable brand. Um, so we call it software free freedom because uh, I believe that uh, you do not own a computer um, that you paid for when you use proprietary software. Some software. Um, I think that it is a, a problem and it gets ever more da dangerous the more you depend upon the software that you use. So if you are uh, using a, I don't know, so you're using a Windows com computer to look up uh, recipes um, every sun sun Sunday to make a cake, the risks there are minor, not that much of a problem, problem right? I mean, free software would be a net positive, but it wouldn't dramatically change the world. But if you're if you're a, a programmer or you're a designer or you're like a person who's using the computer every single day, then it is it's it's in your best interest to push yourself and your tools to free software as much as possible. Because in the long term, free software can never be taken from you. Right? As soon as you become an Inkscape user, you have access to the tools that you you may depend upon those for your job. Um, you have access to that tooling forever and nobody not no government not no corporation not no other in individual can can tell you that you are not allowed to, to use it right and that it, and there's a fundamental right that personally this should be enshrined in law i don't think it should be legal to make proprietary substance and software that you sell on a shelf right because it's deceptive you're not buying anything it's it's a lie 
Um, so personally, my politics are is that this is something that we've gotten into um, because it's easier to earn money through what is effectively a light form of extortion. Um, and we, like as a society, we need to change uh, to being more um, collaborative, less um, loss averse, you know, less mean spirited about like how we share things. Um, and part of that is figuring out what are the effective ways of, of like doing employment, of running a, a, a business, of uh, providing for people while at the same time not removing their freedoms. Um, you know, and, and I know there are plenty of other like open source centric individuals who are more focused on like the collaborative na nature and the fact that the internet provides a lot of collaboration. Uh, but for me, it is a it is a political question. Brilliant. Well, I think we're fast approaching uh, the top of the hour. Um, is there anything else that you would like to uh, say or have an opinion on that you'd like to present to the people watching? I think that is a, a wonderful set of ears. <laughs> Brilliant. Thanks. And just, I, I, when, when, I asked you, when I asked you to dress up for this, I, I was like... Well, you know, I, 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 wasn't I, did, sure. I did put on the... the Jumper as well. <laughs> it's wonderful, it's wonderful. And I have my, my Linux themed uh, sweater. I did I did notice that. Yeah, excellent. <laughs> yeah, I must look for one of those. <laughs> Brilliant. Well, that wraps up this Festus episode, pun intended. Um, I hope you've all had a cool Yule and a fe full of festive fun. And I wish you all health and happiness in the coming year. And please stay safe. And remember, whenever you draw, draw freedomly. <laughs> Brilliant. Thanks very much. And thank you, Martin. Brilliant. Bye, everybody. Merry Bye. Christmas. Bye.